Uh, welcome and good, good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Kurt Kozent, and I uh, want to welcome everybody here for the Lock and Talk Community Forum event. Um, about six months ago, I was at a community event and saw Under Sheriff Rago and said, you know, there's this thing that we could talk about in our community to keep our community safer. Have you thought of this? And he said, actually, we are thinking of this. And uh, we got a group together to come up with what you're going to see tonight. Uh, so we hope that you enjoy it. Uh, there's a number of announcements that I have to go through, um, but certainly uh, do want to thank a number of people as I, as I go through as well. So um, this, um, is, a this is a collective effort, effort to, to promote, promote awareness, awareness and education, and, education, uh, and, and responsible, responsible practices, practices that will ultimately, ultimately save, save lives in our community. In our community. Uh, first, uh, first, I do want to say uh, thank, uh, thank you to, to Elena, Elena Stensma, Stensma from, from ABI, ABI Food, Food Systems, Systems for the catering, for the catering this evening. This evening. Um, please make sure you grab some food. Uh, um, as you please are here, make sure you grab some food. Uh, as you are here, uh, if you get up any time to go ahead and do that. Uh, if you need to use the washrooms at all, they're down the hall uh, into the left. If you need to use the washrooms at all, they're down the hall into the left. Hit the QR code um, We do have a survey. And, uh, if you could uh, hit the QR code before the event here and uh, take our survey. We have a survey before the event and after the event. It would be very helpful to give us feedback on how we can change our programming and make it better or give us feedback of this event. Um, is well being live doing. streamed and while this is a safe um, place um, <clears throat> this event is being live streamed and while this is a uh, safe so place keep that in mind. Um, I would not assume that everything um, here is if anyone is feeling overwhelmed uh, so please uh, keep that certainly uh, head outside and one of our panel speakers mind will, uh, connect with um, you. if anyone yeah, is feeling overwhelmed uh, they can certainly uh, head uh, outside give, uh, and one of our panel our speakers, speakers will, this evening so uh, connect Christy with you Richard and answer any questions your health educator for Ontario County Public Health uh, I do Dr. want to Jessica give a uh, thank you to our speakers this evening. So, Christy County Richard, Senior Health Under Educator for Ontario, County, Ontario County Public County Health Sheriff's Office, Dr. Jessica Dr. Mitchell, Mark Director of Chief of Acute Care Surgery Community Services and for University Ontario University County Rochester. Mental Health, Under Sheriff Michael uh, Rago from the people Ontario County and the Sheriff's Office, I just mentioned, and Dr. Mark like Gestrin, also Chief of Acute the Care Surgery and Trauma at the University of Rochester, um, Ontario County Suicide Prevention Coalition. Uh, in addition to the people uh, the and the organizations I just mentioned, I'd like to also mention the partnership uh, for Ontario thank you for County uh, Community uh, Finger Lakes um, Ontario Community County College, Suicide Prevention this, Coalition, uh, wonderful space, uh, the UR Medicine and Trauma Center, our friend, and the UR Director of PR and Communications. Uh, here at the college for helping us awesome coordinate health. this amazing event. Uh, thank you for uh, um, community uh, sure Finger Lakes Community College free, uh, for the use of locks, this uh, wonderful space and, and to Lenore Friend, the Director of PR and Communications and I will turn uh, here at the Christy college Richard, for helping us coordinate this amazing at event. Ontario County Public Health. Um, please be sure to thank pick you. up your free uh, gun lock. Technology works. Yes. Hello. Welcome to the Lock and Talk Forum. I'm Christy Richards. I'm senior health educator for Ontario County Public Health, and I'm also the co-founder for Ontario County Suicide Prevention Coalition. And we are thrilled that you're spending the evening with us. So we have a very big topic that we're going to talk about tonight. You'll hear our speakers talk about suicide uh, very openly. At first, just hearing the word suicide can be triggering for some people. Um, for this reason that we ask, if you need to leave during the presentation today and you're okay, give us a thumbs up so that we know that you're okay. If you're not okay, give us a thumbs down and we have staff that is willing um, to help you in the hallway. If you um, run out of here to go to the bathroom and don't give me a thumbs up or a thumbs down, they'll chase you to the bathroom. Okay, so for those watching at home, um, and if this, if this topic is triggering to you, don't forget that the 988 Suicide Prevention Hotline is available 24 seven. So in 2017, the Ontario County Suicide Prevention Coalition was formed by members of Ontario County Public Health, the partnership for Ontario County, numerous community agencies and healthcare providers. And as a coalition, we have strived to be able to provide free evidence-based mental health suicide prevention education for Ontario County residents. Lock and Talk is one of our newest, most promising projects. And Lock and Talk was actually, was actually designed by Lock and Talk Virginia. So it's not our idea. Um, it's an initiative to get the public to start talking about mental health 
and suicide prevention while simultaneously locking up firearms, medications, and now that they're so available, edibles. Collectively, in the world um, of suicide prevention, we call these items lethal means. And you may hear that term used a few times tonight, lethal means. Okay, so this is a, sui this is a um, su total suicide per year slide, and this is one of the things that, you know, really kind of takes you aback when you look um, at the statistics uh, for suicide. So I always say when I talk about suicide data that this isn't, like, this is a graph, but it's a graph that represents people. It represents the souls that have lost their battle um, to mental health that are here in my county. Every one of those, those colors, that's someone's loved one, right? Um, someone's brother, someone's sister, and I think it's important that we acknowledge that and that heartbreak. So the burden of suicide is huge. According to the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, 800,000 souls are lost worldwide to suicide. So to break that down, that's one suicide every 40 seconds in the world. In the United States, suicide is the 10th leading cause of death. So here in Ontario County, suicide cases have fluctuated over the years. We've lost 70 residents by suicide since 2016. Um, and those residents, those souls, that's why we're here tonight. That's why we're talking about this. Um, we're talking about this for those that we've lost to suicide. So as far as the statistics go, do you think we've lost more males or more females to suicide? It's a 50-50 split, huh? Okay. Suicide rate is among the teens, the young adults, or the older adults. You're good. Yes, the guess was older, and that is correct. So 33% of Ontario County suicides um, were ages 54 to 72. And that's also reflected in the national data, not just our local data. So if you look at both the 36 to 54 and the 54 to 72 ranges, um, this is something that we call the sandwich generation. Have you ever heard that term? Yeah. The sandwich generation is a generation of people that are taking care of their children, possibly their grandchildren at the same time, possibly their aging parents. They're trying to work and they're trying to get ready to retire all at the same time. It's very, very stressful time in people's lives. And then you add on top of that any... Um, loss that they may have experienced, the loss of a job, the loss of a loved one, the loss of a spouse, all of these things add up. Many people think that it's teens that have the, si the highest suicide rate. When a teen ends their life by suicide, um, they call it a ripple effect, how other people feel, you know, feel that loss around them. But when it happens with a teen, it's almost more like a tsunami effect, right? So every teacher, every student, every parent in the district and surrounding districts hear about this, um, and it, get, it grabs a lot of attention. Uh, but I think we don't get as much of that ripple effect when it happens with adults, correct? So when it happens with adults, you may see something um, like passed away suddenly at home in an obituary. It very rarely will say suicide. Um, so I think it's, it comes to people's minds um, that it's the children because um, of that tsunami effect. Lethal means. Okay. So... As a suicide prevention coalition, we looked at the data, right? We looked at lethal means or objects that are used um, to carry out a self-destructive act. Um, gunshots actually accounted for 43% um, of suicides. Firearms, as we know, are very highly lethal. Um, so we began looking for programs to educate the public about um, mental health and encouraging safe firearm storage. Then we kind of pivoted a little bit and we looked at intentional overdose. 
So we looked to see there was about 6% of suicides were intentional overdoses um, from either a drug or a prescription medication. And as, a, as public health, we can assess that data um, to find out why people are coming into the emergency room, so we're privy to that data. And we began looking at the hospital reported overdoses by age groups. And what we learned was that 13 years old to 26, that had the highest overdose rate per age group, followed by millennials, followed by Gen X, followed by boomers. Anybody want to guess how old the person was that made that slide? No, falls in the millennial category. He calls me a boomer. Okay. <laughs> All right. So what we found is this really exciting evidence-informed program called Lock and Talk Virginia. And it's a free turnkey program um, that helps to inform the public um, that we need to lock up our medication, lock up our firearms, and we need to start talking about our mental health and our safety. So with donations from the Suicide Prevention Coalition of Ontario, the American Foundation for Suicide Prevention, the Partnership for Ontario, the VA Hospital, and the Poison Control Center out of Syracuse, we have distributed hundreds of lock and talk boxes out into our community. And we have had hundreds of conversations about mental health and injury prevention because suicide is preventable. Suicide is preventable, but we do need your help. So when you were asked how you spent your evening tonight, please share with others that you attended the Lock and Talk conversation. Encourage others to lock up and limit access to, to lethal, lethal means. means, because locking up lethal means safely is the most effective method in preventing suicide. This is especially true when limiting access to lethal means during a time of mental health crisis. Let's start talking about mental health. Let's try to reduce the stigma and encourage others, to encourage ourselves to have these health-seeking behaviors. Perhaps most importantly, let's wrap our arms around those that have lived experience with suicide because their risk is exponential. Let's share resources like 911 in an emergency or 211 to help people find mental health counseling or 988 the suicide line. And don't forget our crisis psychic a crisis um, intervention program through Clifton Springs Hospital as well, psychiatric hospital. So the Lock and Talk is just one piece, right? So um, the Lock and Talk is one piece. We have many other trainings. We have the mental health first aid training, and that is for the um, youth, and we have one for adults. We have applied suicide intervention skills training. We hold two of those a year. That's an intense training. It's two days. We have Talk Saves Lives, and we're always looking for invitations to come out into the community with that. It takes about an hour. For health classes, I can do it in about 40 minutes. Safe Talk, which is four hours. Um, we have an Anchor Box project that we welcome you to take a, a look at at our table out here, and that's really helping to provide hope to people that are struggling mentally. Um, and we have the chronic disease self-management groups happening in our community right now, and that helps people um, with chronic disease, chronic pain, um, people dealing with addiction, and um, people dealing with mental health uh, issues to be able to better handle their own chronic disease and manage that chronic disease. Last but not least, Empower OC. So we more about the mental health resources in Ontario County. Um, I want to welcome you um, and thank you all so much for coming to Lock and Talk Ontario. And I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Jessica Mitchell from Ontario County Mental Health.
I am Jessica Mitchell and I am the Director of Community Services for Ontario County and essentially that is the Commissioner of Mental Health for Ontario County. Um, in my role at the county, I oversee um, mental health services, substance treatment services, and developmental disability services. So it's a big job <laughs> to take on. So, um, and today I'm here to talk a bit about um, youth, in particular um, signs of depression, and maybe a little bit about what suicide might look like in a youth versus an adult. So. Um, you can kind of see, I, I created, thanks to Christy Richards, this idea, um, a mind map that just kind of gives you kind of an overview or an outlook of what um, youth depression and suicide, you know, looks like. Um, so at the top, you can see that there are typically, when we talk about mental illness, um, d such as depression, that really is um, a disease that affects all lots of aspects of a person. So how they think, how they perceive the world, how they perceive themselves. Um, and so each mental illness really can affect, um, you know, thoughts or cognitions, such as thoughts and perception. Um, it can also impact the way that they behave or the way that they interact with other people um, in their environment. And as well as cause, obviously, some physical symptoms um, and physiological symptoms. Um, and obviously some emotional symptoms. So just like I wanted to give kind of an overview of what are we talking about? What are some of the signs that you might look for um, if you're an educator or somebody that works with children or a parent of a child? Um, and basically what you can see is what we are showing here are kind of the most uh, common symptoms in those categories. So um, you can see that when youth are struggling with mental health, such as depression, they have cognitive symptoms. The ones that you see up here that are most common are like hopelessness, um, helplessness. Hopelessness would be things like, they might say things about, you know, um, t not, not future focus. So they might just talk about, you know, things will never get better, you know. Um, I'll never feel feel the same, or things will not change. Um, things happen because you know uh, of bad luck or bad, you know. So everything kind of is um, very black and white in that sense. But that those themes of hopelessness would be the things that you're kind of being aware of, because those are um, definite um, concerning warning signs, as you'll see below, for potential suicide. Um, helplessness, same thing. Nobody can help me. Nobody understands where I'm coming from. I don't have any friends. Um, those kind of things. And then, of course, suicidal or violent thoughts are very common with uh, depressive symptoms with youth. Um, so they might make st maybe preoccupied with death or dying or make specific statements about, you know, well, I won't, you know, things will end soon. You know, my pain will end soon something like that might be a warning sign for something um, like suicide. Um, it obviously can affect your concentration um, and those sorts of things. Other things to kind of be aware of that might indicate that a youth is struggling with depression are some of the emotional symptoms. So the ones that we commonly think of, right, when we think about depression are, you know, sad mood or depressed mood. But in youth, um, depression, doesn't necessarily look like sadness or depression. It looks more like anger, irritability, um, and also, you know, low, low frustration tolerance. So they're easily irritated or um, something that's a small situation is kind of blown up or out of proportion and their reaction to that situation might be really intense. Um, and the other very common symptom of depression in children is also uh, basically lack of interest or no pleasure or like they do things that they, they used to enjoy but they don't actually enjoy them anymore. Um, and so then you start to see some of the behavioral, behavioral changes with depression, which are things like they stop wanting to associate with friends, family, they might isolate more. Um, withdrawal from from people or things that they normally would do, activities that they normally would do, they might, you know, skip or, you know, start to refuse, um, 
so that they can avoid you know those feelings when they're in those kind of situations more so so that isolation and withdrawal is very common um, symptoms uh, behavioral symptoms of of depression um, and then of course there are physical symptoms when youth or people in general feel depressed they feel just generally kind of sick feeling they don't feel healthy they feel kind of yuck that yucky feeling um, sometimes they might report feeling numb or empty um, and you can see like a lot of you know things like in their just even in their their like when you look at them they look slowed down you know they're not moving as quickly um, they look sleepy or um, just kind of generally um, not like they're looking very healthy or well there's a lot of appetite changes that come it could be an increase in appetite it could be a decrease it could be a significant weight change um, either weight loss or increase in weight um, and obviously there could be also some other physiological symptoms of uh, depression like stomach aches body aches um, headache is pretty common so um, now the interesting and, and sometimes frustrating thing about youth is that some of these things are things that if any of the folks in the room have teenagers <laughs> could kind of seem pretty normal <laughs> right um, and so that's the difficulty with uh, kiddos sometimes is that um, in youth some of those symptoms may be symptoms of just normal adolescence <laughs> um, and so how do you tell the difference well um, there's risk factors or things to kind of be aware of that might you know obviously if you have a bunch of these symptoms over a two-week period of time and they're starting to impact your functioning that is what determines whether something is normal sadness or something more serious like depression but some of the other risk factors to be aware of when deal when talking about youth are you can see above some of the common things that put them at risk are you know like peer conflicts having a lot of just um, you know relations relational issues or a lot of um, uh, negative interactions with peers um, you know either through social media or things that they share or talk about with friends or family um, about things that are going on at school um, things like a significant change in the way that the youth is performing at school like maybe they normally get you know B's and now their their grades are more like C's D's they're having trouble remembering to turn in homework um, and or they're just not able to focus as well so they start to kind of slip in those areas um, other things that are pretty um, high risk factors for uh, depression in youth are things like family conflict so having in particular a lot of express what we call expressed emotion in the home so these are situations where you know uh, there's a lot of arguing um, hostility or art you know fighting at home either between parents right or the child in the parent and um, the expressed emotion is you know basically experienced by um, you know youth uh, who are depressed as being very stressing you know stressful overwhelming and so having that like emotion that high intense emotionality in the home can put kids at higher risk for developing things like depression um, other things that like personality factors that might contribute to um, or risk for depression are things like having you know low self-confidence um, low self-esteem uh, they don't feel like they're you know experts or uh, good in, in, in anything um, so those are the things that you uh, in of course certain groups of kiddos um, such as those in the LGBTQ community um, they are also at a much higher risk of depression because they are grappling with all the things that <laughs> teenagers normally do in addition to uh, some really like right now especially with their self-identity um, and and that's you know um, puts them at a greater risk of you know developing um, poor coping skills like 
drug use and things like that that put kids at higher risk. Those who are from those groups are much higher risk for um, depression and other um, unhealthy coping mechanisms because of all the different things that come with having to kind of wrap your head around what this means and then the reactions might you might get from other kids, um, your family, you know. So um, things to just kind of be aware of is that when you're seeing these things in combination um, over like a two week period of time um, and there are significant changes in that person's, in that teen's behavior, those are the things that you're really queuing into. How do you tell normal, you know, teenage behavior from abnormal? Well, part of it is knowing your child, right? Knowing that kid, whether it's the teacher knowing the kid, the coach, or the parent, right? If some, if, if some of this are things that you normally don't see in that child, especially um, things that seem like significant changes over a short period of time, like let's say, like again, over the past two weeks or within the last month, then, you know, that could be a red flag. That's something to watch out for in terms of like, you know, is this very different from how they usually are? Um, so looking for those changes are um, really kind of key for helping to, you know, um, identify whether a youth is struggling with depression. And why is it important? Well, because depression, as we know, can lead to serious um, uh, thoughts and contemplation about death, dying, or suicide. Um, and a lot of times, youth who are depressed struggle in silence. And so they could be grappling with a lot of um, suicidal and, and or homicidal thoughts and um, not feeling comfortable to really kind of put that out into the world and admit to that, right, because of stigma. And how do we overcome that? How do we get kids to open up about how they're really, um, what they're really going through, their emotional pain, is we talk about it, right? Suicide is preventable, and we'll hear more about that today. But basically, um, you know, having an open conversation about, you know, hey, like I've noticed you know, that you, you know, thing, you just, your mood seems different, you seem more irritable, I'm worried about you, and I'm wondering, are you having thoughts of suicide, or are you having thoughts about killing yourself? And just being very direct, very empathetic, um, and in tune with kids and how they're doing and feeling comfortable to have those conversations is the first step to getting that child help. is Ontario County Sheriff, under Sheriff Rago. Thank you, Doctor. Evening. Do my best to use the microphone here. I hope to not go rogue and start talking with my hands and end up uh, being off mic. Uh, I commend everybody for being here, uh, the partners on this. Uh, it's such a heavy, heavy topic, but everybody dropped what they were doing, and, and here we are. Uh, it came together really within, it was kind of amazing how I had had a, four, a conversation four days apart with Tracy and Kurt and said, we got to sit down together because we can, we can really create something um, great for the community to roll out. Uh, so I'm the undersheriff with the sheriff's office, and the guy with the gun uh, was delegated to talk about guns. Uh, so, uh, you know, some of that basic, it, it all comes back to respect of a firearm. I grew up in a household where, you know, hunting and fishing is, is you know, comes second to very few things. And I was raised around it. Um, it's part of my profession, so it's, it's a norm for myself. Uh, but, you know, we have to treat every firearm as it's loaded. Always keep the muzzle pointed in a safe direction. We teach recruits in the academy that imagine that firearm has a laser on it, and at any point in time, you know, if that muzzle uh, glances on anyone, you know, it's, it's, lethal, it's lethal force. Keep our finger off the trigger, 
until we're ready to shoot and know our target and beyond. Consider all weapons as they're loaded and secure a firearm in a locked location, out of sight, out of reach of a child or someone that is susceptible to having suicidal tendencies. Never leave a, a weapon locked in a vehicle. It needs to be secured. Second, It needs a secondary source of being secured within a vehicle. That was actually put into law in September. There's different avenues to accomplish that. This is a uh, shows a lock spot a lock box they have biometric lock boxes that go in center councils never store a firearm in a nightstand under a pillow unlocked in a desk or a dresser common sense just has to prevail with firearm storage <clears throat> talk educate and parent mostly right Talk to our children about firearms. Teach them to respect a firearm. Teach them what to do if they come across a firearm, not to touch it. Firearm, a firearm cannot hurt someone if it's not being handled. The likelihood that a firearm somehow is discharged when it's not being handled is nearly impossible. It's when it's being handled that it could be discharged. So teach, or, teach children, grandchildren, whoever it may be, not to touch a firearm, call for a responsible adult, to secure the firearm. So firearms in relation to suicide, where the access to a gun in a home increases the odds of suicide more than threefold. Firearms and suicidal tendencies are a deadly combination, um, as we saw from Christie's data specific to, to Ontario County. Um, and research constantly, consistently shows that access to firearm increases the risk of suicide, especially when there's a firearm stored loaded and unlocked. If it's accessible to someone and that's their means of choice, we're making it readily available to them. Firearms are so dangerous when someone's at risk of suicide because they're the most lethal suicide attempt method and survival rate is very slim because it is so lethal. The more time it takes for someone to attempt suicide, the more time there is for someone to intervene, to put in safe plans, to get them the resources they need. So if someone at that height of their crisis has access to a loaded, unlocked firearm in that small window of lapse in judgment, we could end up with a, a lethal a lethal outcome. So if we can delay that, the rate of survival is much, much better for the person. The research shows that few individuals substitute means of suicides if their preferred method is not available. If firearms are not available, the person at risk for suicide is much more likely to survive, even if they attempt another method. And delaying that suicide attempt can allow suicide crisis to pass and lead to fewer suicides. Preventable. 90% of individuals who attempt suicide do not eventually go on to die by suicide. So if we think how lethal a firearm is, if we can buy that time to put the resources in place to hopefully prevent it, likely the person will likely go on to to live and not die by suicide. Temporarily reducing access to lethal means, putting time and space between someone who may attempt suicide and lethal means, specifically firearms, makes it more likely the person will survive that suicide attempt and work through that crisis. Though a person may consider suicide for a long time, providing um, opportunities to intervene and that risk reduction, if we can mitigate that risk, the suicidal crisis as it peaks may be relatively quick for many people. And again, that access to firearms during these high risk period of time is that key factor. If we can buy that window to work through the crisis, we can um, likely give the better 
give the person a better opportunity at survival. Some statistics, these are national statistics. The firearms are used in half of all suicide deaths and that suicides make up three in every five gun deaths. Suicide attempts by firearms are almost always deadly. Nine out of 10 attempts result in a fatality. And every day in America, 64 people die by suicide. It's one every 22 minutes. Staggering numbers that truly in a 100% preventable case. Some numbers from 2019, over 20, nearly 24,000 people in America died from firearm suicide. So some of the questions arise, how do we develop a safe plan? This came great collaboration from Christy. Some of the things we were always asked, what can I do? What am I legally able to, to do in this situation? If I have a family member, friend that is headed down that road and some of the things that I've already spoken to re revert me back to some of the initial training I got with dealing with mental health crisis is asking someone if they're suicidal will not make them suicidal. It's, it's a hard question to ask, uh, and you have to be empathetic about it, but truly, that it will not push them over the edge. So when we get to that point, how do we make a safe plan for firearms? Who can legally store firearms in the state of New York? Long guns can be stored, can be turned over to a parent, sibling, or a federal firearms dealer, a license, a gun shop, um, or local law enforcement. Handguns are more difficult. Uh, they have to go through a federal f uh, firearms license dealer or law enforcement. Most local small gun shops don't have the space to be able to store large, you know, a large gun library of, of uh, firearms and, and would likely refer the person to local law enforcement. And we safe keep hundreds and hundreds of guns. So um, we're uh, readily available to be able to, to do that. The only exemption with handguns is if they're co-registered on like a, uh, a family member's permit, spouse, uh, you know, mother, daughter, father, son. Uh, if they're co-registered on a permit, then, you're, then the person would be able to maintain uh, possession of those firearms. These are where my statistics came from for the resource. Again, thank you. Uh, and I get to turn it over to uh, Dr. Gestman. Good evening. Appreciate the opportunity to be here, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak after so many, uh, so many different perspectives. Because we kind of work together to not tell you the same thing four times. Right? That's kind of our goal. So we're looking at the same problem from different perspectives. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to talk about responsible gun ownership. Right? And I have had the privilege of seeing the undersheriff slide, so I'm not going to tell you the same things he said. Right? We're very careful to do that. Uh, responsible gun ownership and suicide prevention are intimately linked. You've heard that in a number of different ways. Right? So uh, I'm not going to talk about any of these political things around guns. Guns are pervasive in our community for a number of reasons. Right? We're not going to get into any of that stuff today. Right. I, I can tell you I am not a gun expert. The man with the gun is a gun expert. I'm not a gun expert. I'm not a mental health expert. I'm here with mental health, health experts. But I am an expert in injury prevention. Uh, and we have been do I've been doing this my whole career, and I work with people who are very good at this. <clears throat> so that's kind of my perspective on this, is to prevent people from getting injured. Um, 
everything I say is relevant to medications. I'm, I'm speaking specifically about firearms, but the idea of keeping people safe is really what we're after, right? So a large number of people are, are killed each year with firearms, and a significantly bigger number are injured. Uh, you know this. You hear this every day in the news, right? So I like to break it down to be kind of really simple about how, how to look at this and, like, how do people get hurt with guns, right? And this is not a trick question, right? Everybody knows this, right? You can be shot intentionally by somebody who is trying to shoot you. You can, you can attempt or commit suicide, or there are a number of other kinds of ways, whether it's accidental or, um, you know, police involved or all these other kinds of things that can happen. All right, the middle column is obviously the smallest, but uh, we talk about those things resulting in injury and death. Each of those are addressed in different ways, but responsible gun ownership is really core to all of the prevention strategies, no matter which side of these you're coming from, right? So just to look at intentional violence, it's not my goal at all to talk about this today, except that people get shot. People get shot a lot, right? Not far from here, they get shot a lot, right? So the majority of people who are committing crimes with guns, and during the questions you can quiz the under sheriff, these are not people who are going to a gun store, filling out the form, right? They're stealing these guns or getting a hold of these guns. So if you are irresponsible in the way you keep your legally registered, properly maintained firearm, but you left it in your car, you left it unlocked in your house, and somebody gets a hold of it, you are now contributing to this problem, right? So it's a perspective people don't frequently think about, right? We've talked a lot about suicide here, right? So over 50%, you've seen the number a couple of different ways, but when you talk about gun deaths, more people die from suicide than they do from the stuff you hear about in the news every single day. Except you hear about it in the news every single day for the lower number, but you don't hear about the suicides. Like you said, it's died suddenly or something like that. Right, so over 50% of people in the U.S. died due to suicide, right? And people have guns in their homes, like you've heard from the other speakers. It is not difficult to use a gun to commit suicide, right? So if you have a gun and it works, Unfortunately, it's pretty easy to use to hurt yourself. Other methods are more difficult. You have more time to think about, you know, sitting in your car, sniffing the tailpipe, those kinds of things, right? But once you make a bad decision with a gun, it usually works, right? So one of the things that's so key when you talk about safety and safe storage, right, like it says here, storage devices do not limit your access to your gun, right? So if you're the guy with the combination to the safe, you're the guy with the key to the lock, the idea is somebody in your life should be looking for the warning signs you heard about, right? So if you're exhibiting some of those warning signs, somebody hopefully in your family will recognize those things. Somebody um, somewhere in your life will help recognize those things and help you temporarily separate from that gun. It's not a crime. It's not a red flag issue. You can, you can voluntarily surrender the gun, just like the undersheriff said, to any police department. They will hold that gun for you, right, and w until you're out of crisis. All right, so this is, a, this is really a key point that many people don't think about. Uh, we have spent a lot of time at the University of Rochester looking at this unintentional or accidental um, firearm thing. Uh, once again, it's a safe storage, safe storage issue, right? So safe storage prevents unauthorized access to your gun. Right? That's a pretty common statement. I don't think anybody's going to criticize or argue with me about that. right? But if I ask you who you're protecting your gun from, your answer is going to be different than mine. Right? I think the, unauthor the unauthor unauthorized access you need to be worried about can come from outside the home, burglars, right? That's the, the, the category of people who are trying to steal your gun. But the bigger danger is people inside your home. All right? So if you think you have a secured gun, but everybody in your house has the key, it's not secure. If you think your gun is locked in a safe, but the combination for the safe is pinned next to the safe and everybody in your house knows it, it's not safe, right? So it's not for me to judge, but you have to be able to assess the risk factors that exist in your house. And do you want a loaded weapon ac accessible to your 16-year-old who was called fat on the same day she failed the test on the same day a boyfriend broke up with her, right? Those kinds of things, right? Those, those teenage things pass quickly, but it's much safer to go through those types of crises without having immediate access to a loaded weapon. Right, so that's my point there. 
So one of the things we look at, I'm not going interject, to interject a lot of science into this, but when you look at this from a public health point of view, you can break it down with, with this tool called the Haddon Matrix, where you look for phases of injury and inf influencing factors, right? And the piece that we're talking about today is what can we do before the injury happens, right? There's certain things you can do during the injury to prevent death. There's certain things you can do afterwards to prevent it from happening again. But we're focusing specifically on what do we have in our power to do before the, before the gun is, is fired. And it turns out on the medical side, there's a lot of things we can do. We can talk about safe storage. We can talk about teaching children about the risks. We can teach people about how to properly store things. There's a lot of those little green boxes that are relevant to everyday life, which prevent people from getting injured with guns and also cause people to think about the intentionality of suicide and access to weapons, All right? So that framed kind of the, that's the framework for a program that we're very proud of that we do um, just up the street in Monroe County. I was gonna share that with you real quickly with a bunch of pictures, but um, we basically put together a regional outreach program to talk about specifically responsible gun ownership, right? So we go anywhere we're asked. Most of what we do is in Monroe County, but we'll go anywhere that we're asked, right? The, the philosophy of the whole program is Everybody has a right to own a gun, right? But once you have that right, you also have the responsibility to make sure it's secure in the ways that we just talked about, right? So wherever that threat potentially could come from, all right? So these, this is the cover of a book which is available outside here for anybody to take. It's called Gun Safety and Your Health. It's a very, um, it was put together by the American College of Surgeons and it's a very generic um, uh, source, a well, uh, well-referenced source for information about this topic, but we, specifically try to interact with gun owners. We meet gun owners on neutral ground and we address their issues. I'll share you a little bit about how that will be, right? It's a, it's a collaborative effort. We work with the Monroe County Sheriff's Department. We've had suicide and mental health experts help us kind of craft our message, uh, local government and also private sector. So we've received donations and things like that in the process. The idea is we actively engage gun owners and more specifically their families. So the gun owner and the spouse, for instance, or the kids, that kind of stuff. And we provide easy access to experts and answers to questions that are not, like you would have to get online or you would have to call the police department or you'd have to seek somebody out. We're here, you're just talking to somebody, right? And we really work on individualized uh, issues. So if you come and talk to us and you're specifically worried about somebody in your house, we're going to point you down this pathway. If you're worried about the law, about what do I do with my gun at a rest stop, we're going to point you down this pathway, that kind of stuff. So it's not one size fits all, but we engage people in conversation and do our best to answer their questions and address their concerns. And if at the end of that conversation it turns out their gun is laying in a cabinet somewhere, we help them with a gun lock until they can come up with a better solution. Right? We're giving you gun locks here. Those are great until somebody takes your gun, right? They can, so it's great for preventing that gun from going off in your house in front of a kid, for instance, or something like that. But there's no problem with stealing your gun and cutting that thing off later, right? So it's, it's a good temporary solution, but it is not the answer to the question, right? So you can see we have a number of different formats, right? But we're talking about gun laws, talking about safe storage, talking about gun safety, similar to what the under sheriff was talking about, uh, injury prevention strategies for preventing firearm injury in your own house, and then individualized risk assessments. Uh, so what, what are we doing? You have this pamphlet is outside there. Uh, all of these things, talking about what do you do with guns when you have kids in the house. Trust me, if you have a gun, your kid knows you have a gun. Even though you don't think they know, they know, especially if you bring it out and use it, right? Uh, we talk about guns and suicide. The new gun laws, for anybody who pays attention, the gun laws change about every 12 and a half minutes. So having somebody who's current on what you're allowed to do, what you're supposed to do, people for the most part are trying to be responsible and do the right thing, but they want to keep up with that. And, and then also, how do you dispose of unwanted guns? Uh, uh, and maybe not unwanted guns, but guns that you feel temporarily are dangerous in your house, right? The sheriff, meant, the under sheriff mentioned this, uh, do not leave guns in cars. Right? Lots of people do. Cars get stolen, cars get broken into all the time, and now you're contributing to this other problem, and your legally registered handgun is now um, off doing something it shouldn't be doing. Right? We talked about this, safety and storage devices are only secure as the precautions you take to protect your key or your combination. Right? So in your house, you have a gun safe. Lots of people are very proud of how much money they spent on their gun safe, but if the key is right next to it, it's not secure. Right? I made that point. 
this is a little bit of what we do, similar to what you have outside. We have a little package with some information booklets and some, um, and some locks, and we show people kind of different locking devices. We interact with kids. What would you do if you found a gun on the street, for instance, talking to a kid? You, you, know, you talk to an adult and all those kinds of things. Uh, we actually bumped into Dr. Osborne at this event. This was at a gun store uh, where we're talking to pr appropriate gun owners about the risks related to their gun, and they're asking us questions about proper ownership and things of that nature. Uh, doing it in all kinds of different community forums, interacting with kids. One of the most, one of the, kind of the, one of the most uh, important interactions we've had recently, we had a kid come up with a parent, and this happens to be in Brighton. We were doing this. Brighton's a pretty liberal place there. We were getting a little bit of a lecture about why are we talking about guns here. And while the parent was lecturing us about why we shouldn't be there with guns, the kid picked up one of those blue plastic guns and held it right into his face and was looking at it. The kid was like five. You know, so it's like, okay, well, I think whether you believe in these things or not, there's a lesson. You know, if you find, if somebody finds a gun on the street, don't pick it up, right? That's all we're telling you. <laughs> That's all we're saying. And that we, we uh, created, um, I think we, we sent a message that day. But anyway, so this is interacting with the public. <coughs> Many of the sources that we point people toward are publicly available, right? So we have the QR codes. You can scan and get it on your phone, or we have pamphlets we send people off with. Um, opportunities to interact with kids. So, you know, like I said, your kids know about your gun. Let's talk about it. So this, they have similar contracts for, for teenagers who drink, right? Potentially getting in drink, drinking and driving situations. So they have similar contracts, contracts, contracts like this, where if I get in trouble with drinking, I'm going to call my parent, and my parent's going to pick me up without asking any questions. These kind of contracts, right? So you talk about it before it's a problem, right? This is really kind of the key for this group. There are a number of resources that are available for people who are at risk. You know, so if you are in a house and you have a loved one in that house and you're worried about them, there are just a number of things to help you kind of navigate that experience, right? Veteran specific, hunter specific, you know, things of that nature, right? How do you give away a gun and get it back once the crisis has passed? Because everybody's worried about losing it forever, right? That's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about keep, keeping somebody safe until they're um, kind of um, out of danger. <coughs> Uh, this is something that we developed in Monroe County. I think you guys kind of put together an Ontario County version, but this is re a really cool part of the collaboration here. So in Monroe County now, if you apply for a gun permit, the, ca the, ca the county clerk, along with all the other junk you get in the mail, you get, a, 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 you get this handout, which talks a little bit about local statistics about guns that get stolen, people who get injured, and on the back is just a bunch of resources that you can look at if you're interested in this. So I was encouraging you guys to look at, maybe you can do that here too. Um, so just in summary, uh, <coughs> the, the decision to have a gun impacts your entire household, right? So to make sure you know how to properly use it, to make sure it is properly stored, kept away from you think, you know, kept purely yours, right? Uh, assume your kids know about your gun, pay attention to the risk factors in your home. And then this slide really applies to medications as well, right? So if you have those gummies people are talking about, you have, you know, dangerous medications that are just sitting out there. Common sense would say you don't leave dangerous medications within the reach of kids, right? And if you have them a little higher, you don't want dangerous medications in the reach of somebody who might want to hurt themselves, right? So certainly, if you're going to hurt yourself, a gun is an efficient way to do that, and we're not advocating this at all, right? But medications are right behind that, which is why this program, I think, is so powerful talking about that. The motto we developed is keep it safe, keep it yours, right? So as an individual, you have a right to own a gun, but as an individual, you have to keep it to yourself and protect it from others, right? So the decision to own that gun impacts the entire household and it's, this fits right into what everybody else was talking about. So, so I'm done. I suspect that we're going to have a bit of a panel discussion, right? Um, and you have an opportunity. If you have questions, we'd love to entertain those questions. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Um, I do want to say one more time thank you to our speakers. Uh, we would love to take questions from uh, anyone in the audience. Does anyone have any particular questions? And um, we will have them addressed uh, as you ask them. Sure. Under Sheriff Rago, if you want to. It's, it's very specific. Uh, 
I can't think of uh, the last time use of force was used to disrupt a burglary. Is that an answer they're going to accept? Likely not. Um, so that's something you have to work through. To, to But usually there's an underlying issue there. They don't know, they don't understand the process that how a firearm could be turned into the sheriff's office, state police, Canandaigua police, Geneva police, and, you know, they'll be issued a receipt and, you know, simply, you know, come up with a safe plan and the firearms could be returned, you know, barring there's no court order or anything of that nature, then they can be returned when they wish to, to return the, you know, obtain their firearms. One thing I would add to that is um, uh, he's exactly right with what he's saying. I mean, the chances of having a home invader are significantly less than the chance of that gun falling into the wrong hands in your own house. Well, having talked to, you know, people in these various settings now over the last probably two years, you'd be surprised how many people do not consider the shotgun in the kitchen or the rifle to be a firearm, right? Everybody pays attention to the, the handgun, but there's a rifle, you know, because we're living in a little bit more rural areas and people, you know, shoot things that come in their backyard or whatever, whatever, and they don't even realize there's a rifle sitting in their kitchen. Uh, and then that is, the, you know, potentially the same risk as some of these other things. And it's not kept there necessarily for home defense. It's, it's kept there because, you know, the bear or the dinosaur or whatever is coming through your yard. And there are uh, biometric safes that people can have that literally within a millisecond that safe is open with your thumbprint or fingerprint and you're just as um, ready to go. God forbid you ever need to do that, but the safes would be a best option for that. Would love to take some more questions. Yes, sir, in the middle. Sure. Um, sure. So the question is, why is it that risk is higher three months after a suicide attempt? Yeah. So um, that has to, I mean, why? We're not exactly sure why. Um, but what the statistics show is that um, 30, like someone is most at risk um, shortly after that um incident occurs because oftentimes when someone has such a thing, like for instance, sometimes they go into a more controlled environment. So maybe they go to the hospital, um, they get treatment, and now they have a lot of support. And then when they return home from having a lot of that support, now there is that higher risk of um, not being able to manage or cope with the intensity of emotions or the crisis if a crisis was to occur. So part of it, at least in terms of, um, you know, for folks especially who are getting the treatment and help they need, uh, because there's a step down from more support to less, there's like this automatic um, uh, increase in risk that then um, what we do, at least in terms of our world and in our clinic, is we usually try to really wrap services around someone, um, keep closer tabs, see them more frequently in the clinic, um, outreach calls in between appointments, um, because we know that there um, is the possibility for that kind of relapse of symptoms. Some of it has to do with that. Um, uh, there is certainly that, um, you know, I think it's a little different um, in that sense, but, uh, but there is the, you know, once someone has made a decision to, or committed to a decision to end their lives, sometimes we do see a boost in their mood. Um, and that's in part uh, from, you know, the relief that perhaps that they get that their pain will be over soon, right? Because they've, they've decided that that's what they're going to do. It's very tricky and it's very difficult to identify um, in the moment because some of it could be improvements, like you're saying, to because of medications or other treatments that they're getting, um, but some of it could be that they have made a decision. So um, it's a very tricky thing to identify um, in the moment, and oftentimes it get, gets identified after the fact. But um, for
for whatever reason, um, and a lot of it has to do with that support, there is an increase in the risk in those 30, in that 30, that 90 day period. Yes. I think the key is not to preach. I'm not telling you how to live your life. I'm not telling you what to do, what not to do. I'm offering you, we, I say I, but we are offering, you know, answers to your questions and, and potential solutions. You know, we're not giving you the solution. We're pointing you toward the solution. So you have to come to us and ask. Right, so we do this program in collaboration with the sheriff's office. So we always have an officer with us who's, who's fluent in the gun laws and fluent in the procedures. So sometimes they have a question for us on the injury prevention side. More likely it's a question for them about, you know, locking things, you know, th those kind, that, that kind of stuff. But having the two of us speaking with one voice really helps. And, you know, I think some of the, some of the conversations related to things like suicide are not necessarily with the person at risk, but you know, a wife will be walking through the farmer's market and says, you know, I have a father at home who's, who's suddenly, you know, has dementia or something like that, and we have some guns in the house, or he has some guns, what would you recommend? You know, once again, I think not to preach. It's, it's, like you said, it's, there's people who have very strong opinions on both sides of the issue. Um, we're not advocating for, own, for owning guns. We're certainly not saying you shouldn't, because we understand in an area like this, lots of people do own guns, right? So this is a, it's a practical approach to the problem. And I think, I don't know if that answers your question, but I think that is, uh, I, some of the more kind of meaningful interactions are with family members who worried about an older relative in the house or an older relative they have at home. You know, it's no different than the, com the, the, the conversation about, well, I'm, I want to take the car keys away because he keeps hitting things, you know, as, as he's getting older driving. Well, it's no different. I mean, if somebody has grown up with guns and now they're starting to have mental health like, or cognitive issues and there's a gun in the house, that's when, that's when family members get worried. And then we point them toward kind of nationally recognized resources on that issue. We have local people as well that we're certainly happy to connect them with. But... I'm not going to volunteer to go to grandpa's house and take his gun away, but I'm going to, I'm going to point them toward proper ways to do that and proper ways to approach that issue. I just had one thing to add to the question that was asked to, to Dr. Mitchell. Um, one of the unfortunate consequences or, or uh, coincidence we see between suicide, completed suicide investigations is that that uptick in mood, like you discussed, but then the other common thing that unfortunately we see is the giveaway of things, that all of a sudden, you know, the plans, they've come to terms with what the plan is, and then there's, you know, small things that are, you know, handed off to a friend or, you know, those are really minute things that could really be a very telling tale of where the person's, you know, mind is, so just another... Just another note to, to keep an eye out for. Thank you. Are there any other questions for this evening? All right, I do want to thank a couple people. So Tracy, uh, Tracy Delistrato from the partnership, uh, thank you very much for all of your work in helping get this together. Dave Carroll from UR Thompson Health, uh, Dave was amazing behind the scenes coordinating all this um, and really did a great job. Uh, I do want to thank Christy Richard, uh, Dr. Mitchell, Under Sheriff Rago, and Mark Gestring, Dr. Gestring from the Trauma Center. Um, everyone here, uh, this is a very weighty subject for all of us, um, yet everyone felt very important to take their time and their evening to come here, bring it to the community uh, to help save lives. And if you could take a piece of what you learned tonight through this information and pass it on to a loved one or a family member to help protect them, that'd be the greatest gift back to all of us. So thank you for your attention this evening and have a great evening, everyone.